This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit luptoncapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. My name is Jonah. Uh, Obviously, very excited for our next guest. It is Alex from Ticker Symbol U. Alex, how are you, man? Good man, how are you? Good. Uh, where are you where are you zooming in from today? I'm zooming in from St. Petersburg, Florida, like maybe a quarter mile from Ark Invest headquarters. Really? Okay. Yep. So, are you like a? Please tell me you didn't move down there just because of Ark. <laughs> I did not. They actually moved down here because of me. Because of you, three, three okay. years before them. You know. So. <laughs> so what what exactly did happen with them? Were they were in New York and then they relocated to relocated everyone to Florida or just some people? No, I uh, so take this with a grain of salt. So I have no connection to Ark Invest. I'm purely an outsider saying this best guess. Um, but I think they relocated some people, mostly on the financial side, down to St. Petersburg because it's a gorgeous burgeoning city. It's summer here all the time. And they're building an ARC innovation center here. So they're building a separate 45,000 square foot business incubator right on my street, actually. Uh, So I I think they wanted to be close and oversee that as well. It's like probably 70% through construction. I have tons of pictures. What? I mean, I, I... I guess I did hear about that. I just never looked into it any deeper. What is that innovation center going to do? I mean, are they looking to bring in like fintech entrepreneurs and invest capital in them? I'm not sure about the invest capital part, but the rest of it is dead on. I'm sure they're going to share their research. They're going to build like some sort of incubator ecosystem where they can help people out in certain ways, connect them to bigger products and technology suites. And yeah, maybe invest capital in there. I know they have a venture fund now, so it might be one of those like public private options. So we'll see. Okay. Um, and I'm sure a lot of their people are probably working remote. Uh, yeah. So they're not all down there. And then obviously taxes are a hell of a lot better in Florida than they are in, in New York City. So Yes, they are. <laughs> um, let's start with ARC because I know you've covered ARC for a while now and you have some you know, good and bad things to say, I suppose. So if someone asks you about ARC, like what's the first thing that you typically tell them? Yeah, so ARC is pretty different. So they are a family of actively managed ETFs managed by their CEO and CIO, Kathy Wood. Uh, They're thematic ETFs. So they have one focused on advanced internet technology. They have another one on autonomy and robotics, space exploration, right? So they're these really uh, forward-looking technical thematic ETFs. So they behave a lot more like growth stocks than they do traditional ETFs like your SPY or your triple Qs or whatever. Um, There's good and bad things about that. The good things are obviously they're cutting edge research. You're investing in growth companies that should be doing way better tomorrow than some of the legacy companies that you can invest in today. Um, And you also get some of the bad. So I'm trying I'm trying not to like frame this as good and bad, but you know, this, this this conversation would be so much different if we were having it 2 years ago when yeah. you know, Arc Arc was on fire and you know just coming off a triple digit year and Exactly. You know, now now exactly. the down like now their main their main ETF which is ARKK is probably still down 75 80% from the highs. Yeah. Uh, some of their stocks are down 90 to 95% from their highs. Uh, yeah. you know, for anyone not watching, like their their biggest name, I think, is still Tesla. Correct. That's true. And, yep. then, and then their next two biggest holdings, I think, are Zoom and Roku. That's correct. Okay. So, and those two have been absolutely annihilated from, yeah. from time highs. And so one of the big, so there's good and bad, right? So the good is they're really on the pulse of cutting edge technology, including artificial intelligence, genomics, blockchain technology, energy storage, everything like that, right? So you can learn a lot about the future from some really smart people in the finance space by following them. The bad part is they're actively managed and they seem to be sort of like trend chasers in the sense that generative AI is exploding. So they're going to invest more heavily in what appears to be anything related to generative AI, regardless of the price. And they're willing to trade daily. They're actively managed funds. So sometimes you'll see these weird trades where it's like they bought in very high and then they sold out very low much later to reinvest in something else. And it's not clear to me one of the things that we don't know as outside shareholders is which lots they're actually selling to do that. So which trades are profitable and which trades are not are actually pretty hard to determine from the outside. Uh, For example, they bought Tesla first time many, many years ago. So when they're selling shares now, even at a local low, 
you know, it's recent low price or whatever, those could be still very profitable trades from them because they could have been selling shares from five years ago, right? So that's that's something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is sometimes the names like you were saying, Roku and Zoom, you know, those aren't exactly the frontier of the space that we imagine when we think about space exploration stocks or stocks that are benefiting from the next generation of artificial intelligence and internet applications. And then as we got into right before uh, we started the recording, I think some of their analyst models, like their actual financial models come into question. So, right. I mean, I do think if you go back five, six, seven years, Roku, Roku was a disruptive, innovative company. But now with like every TV you buy being a smart TV from Amazon Fire or someone else, it just seems like Roku is not really the disruptive innovator that it was five or six years ago. And and Art just never figured that out. Zoom was certainly a disruptor during the pandemic when we were all on Zoom all day long. But then like the pandemic's over. And yes, we all Zoom still, but like the company's not growing revenues at 400% a year anymore. They're growing at like 10 or 15% a year. But it seemed like, you know, when ARC was doing these investment models, they just assumed these growth rates were going to be 40, 50, 60% forever and ever, and never even imagined that there'd be some slowdown. So I, I agree with you. I think their research is good. I think their investment models are questionable. <laughs> yeah. At best. Yeah. Uh, so, so just to play devil's advocate, because I, I love steel manning like the other side of, you know, these really interesting nuanced discussions, right? Um, I think one thing that they do very well is they can find the societal value of things like Roku and Zoom, right? There's no question that these companies, like, let's just take Roku as an example. Amazon has a product that competes with them. Google has a product that competes with them. And yet Roku actually has a massive market share when it comes to like connected TVs that seemingly these companies that are hundreds of times bigger than them cannot displace them as like the king of. So there's clearly something intangible about Roku that is making them special, right? And the question is, how much is that worth? You know, I think we all agree that Roku is probably actually the best solution. Their TVs don't lag. Most smart TVs, like you were talking about, actually have the Roku operating system built in. There's like reasons to invest in Roku if you believe in that their superior technology also gives them a superior valuation. And the question isn't, do they have superior technology? I think the answer is yes. The question is, how much is that actually worth? Like, why would I invest in Roku when if I buy a Google stock or an Amazon stock instead, I also get this incredible portfolio of other things they do, right? So and even though I, you know, obviously buying ARC and, you know, we're looking in a rear view mirror here, buying ARC two years ago at the highs was a big mistake. But now that it's already taken its punishment, it's down 80%. Some of these stocks are down 90%. They're back down to valuations that actually start to make some sense. Yep. You know, and if you do look forward three, four, five years, I do think it's possible that ARC outperforms the SPY, the NASDAQ. Oh. Um, you know, I think the question is, what does growth look like for some of these companies going forward? And then what does the dilution look like? Because a lot of their... A lot of the art companies are still founder led, but that also means a lot of insider selling, no insider buying. And it also means a lot of SBC, a lot of dilution. I mean, some of these companies like Coinbase, for instance, uh, DraftKings, Palantir. Uh, oh, Palantir. I mean, the, the annual dilution through SBC is just insane. Correct. Um, and unless they really grow, you know, you can outgrow that, you can expand margin fast enough to, you know, sort of, I don't know, cancel it out or overcome it. But yeah, I mean, if these companies don't grow 30, 40% a year and expand margins, that SBC, you know, it, it will hold the, uh, hold the stock price back, I think. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And so what I've been doing lately, uh, especially on my channel, what I do is I talk about their trades, I talk about their research, and then my recommendation is always take these companies and put them on your own watch list. It's not about buying them right now, but it's about understanding the trends that will lead to like higher valuations in the future. And now you have a really great starting point. You don't have to dig through whatever 6,000 publicly listed companies. You're now you're just down to like the 120 that, you know, Arc has spent a lot of time deciding are disruptive innovators. And then you can choose your 15, 20, 30 out of those, depending on what you have a preference for as a person, the products and services you use, the future that you believe in, right? So like, my channel focuses a lot on crafting an investment thesis in your future and then investing in that. So, 
What are some so outside of arc? Uh, what are some other themes that you follow closely? Yeah. So uh, my the biggest theme I follow closely that I wish arc would invest in, and I'm not really sure why they don't, is definitely the semiconductor space. So advanced AI chips, accelerators, CPUs and GPUs, things like that. And that's just because my academic background's in electrical engineering and applied math. So I just, I've used those products in a professional setting. So I understand their advantages, their disadvantages, their software and hardware ecosystems, the kind of things they're good at and not good at, the infrastructure they support and data centers and supercomputers and things like that. So that kind of gives me a leg up, if you will, in that category. So I tend to like focus on my strengths as an investor. So the only, I mean, I, of all the sectors out there, especially the larger ones, semiconductors is really the one that I've stayed away from because I just sure. don't really understand it. And there's just so many like aspects to it. And like you said, there's some big players. I mean, obviously there's NVIDIA, there's AMD, there's the legacy players like Intel, Qualcomm, and then you have Taiwan Semi and ASML. Yep. And it's like, holy crap, where the hell do I start? And I do think like, to a certain extent, some people be better off just buying like one of the semi ETFs, you know, sure. SOXX, I think is one and SMH is another one. Yep. But let's say they wanted to drill down and, and try to understand this, this industry. Like, you know, it looks like NVIDIA is the leader in AI. It look, I might be wrong. You know, AM, AMD is starting to, you know, kind of kicking ass in like PCs, you yeah. know, taking market share from Intel. Qualcomm has always dominated the cell phone market. Yep, 5G, but, yep. And I assume that's going to continue, although I don't know if Apple's doing their own chips. I heard something along those lines. So like, yep. where, where do you even start? Like, where would someone even start to dig in and try to figure out which of these companies, you know, might might be the most promising for investors going forward? Sure, yeah. So first of all, I think you did a great job introducing the whole space. So I think you're <laughs> way more up on it than you're giving yourself credit for. But basically, I think of things in sort of three layers, right? The first and most foundational layer are companies like ASML. Those are the companies that are building the machines and the tools that build the chips, right? So you're thinking about and, if and you just could, people don't, these are like school bus sized machines, right? Yeah. Yes. They so I think they they cost something like a quarter billion dollars a piece. They take like three cargo planes to move, something oh like 20 God. trucks move them. You know, thousands of vendors come together to build them. But the system designer is a company called ASML. They're a Dutch company. And what they do is they put all the pieces together and they work on a process called lithography. And lithography is the process where you take like ultra high um wavelength lasers and you etch chips onto those silicon wafers, those really pretty wafers that you see in all sorts of like chip commercials. So that's what they do. They etch designs at a fundamental level onto these wafers. They do a whole bunch of other things. But so them and companies like them are sort of the guts. They're the oven in the kitchen, so to speak, right? Like you need your chef, you need your oven, and then you care about your final product. They build the oven. The chef is going to be a company like TSMC. And TSMC is a foundry, pure play foundry. And what that means is they take chip designs from other people, so recipes, and then they build those chips for them. So they build chips for Apple, they build chips for Nvidia, they don't build any chips for themselves. TSMC doesn't have any products or services other than building chips for other companies. So that's like one layer up. So that's the chef, they have the oven, and then what they do is they create, you know, muffins or tacos or whatever your analogy is for companies like Apple, Nvidia, and whatever. And so that's the third piece of the puzzle is what applications do you care about? Are you a big believer that the iPhone is the best phone? Then maybe you care about Apple with the understanding that, hey, Apple designs these things, but TSMC builds them and puts them together along with Foxconn and other companies that develop all these different parts. And the machines at Foxconn and TSMC and all that are built by one layer down companies like ASML. So TSM, Taiwan Semi, is obviously based in Taiwan. Yep. If if China invaded Taiwan, what would that mean for the global semiconductor industry? Yeah, I, I think that's a big reason that China may not invade Taiwan as soon as some people expect. Um, I, I think it would be catastrophic. So for example, something like 60% of all semiconductors come from Taiwan. There's other uh, foundries besides TSMC in Taiwan. There's two or three others. Um, but 90% of the world's advanced chips come from just TSMC. And when I say advanced chips, what I really mean is the small chips, high performance chips that make it into your phones. 
and then the advanced chips that tend to make it into modern data centers, right? So if China invaded Taiwan, it would be catastrophic for the global chip supply chain. We would have a chip shortage and a whole bunch of things would happen. Compute would get much more expensive. So you would see companies like Netflix, just as an example, raise their prices a lot because the equivalent data centers would become much more expensive. Your iPhones and other electronics would also become more expensive because consumer electronics, like modern consumer electronics, also rely on these advanced chips. Uh, and then there would be a whole bunch of knock-on effects. Like the last time we had a semiconductor shortage, car prices went way up because the chips inside of cars were the bottleneck in getting new cars to the dealer that could be sold, right? Well, so I was just going to ask you that because, I mean, do you remember during the, the pandemic, people were talking about, you know, Ford and GM having like all these cars ready to made, just sitting in parking lots waiting for chips. Yeah. Yeah. Who, whose chips were those? Who makes those chips? Um, so I'm not sure. I don't think all of them were made out of TSMC. I heard, I, I feel like I remember reading an article. Don't quote me on this, but if I remember right, Tesla was in the process of making their own chips and they had a whole like separate supply chain of chips, which is why they were mostly all right. But then they were also doing funny things like taking apart washing machines because some of the chips inside those could be like reprogrammed to work inside the cars for certain applications. So they had this funny way of like getting over the chip shortage themselves that obviously worked really well because they weren't relying on thousands and thousands of other vendors to come together to build their cars, right? Like Tesla is very vertically integrated. Are there any foundries in the US that could, you know, if Taiwan Semi was unable to keep up with demand, not just for China, for any other reason, and NVIDIA and some of these other companies, could they have those chips made in the US? Uh, so the short answer is yes, but not soon. So with the CHIPS Act, providing lots of incentives for different foundries to come to the United States and build their foundries here, we are doing a lot of onshoring of that chip production, but that's still in the future. Those foundries, I can't remember which ones have broken ground and which ones have not, but they're certainly not up and ready and building chips today and at capacity, right? So that's a long few year road to get those ramped up. But yes, in a few years, TSMC will have one or two big modern foundries in the United States, in Arizona, I believe, yep. making chips. But even with that, the majority of their chips will be made still in Taiwan, just to okay. be clear. Um, what about AI? I know you do a lot with AI. Obviously, you know, NVIDIA sort of plays into that as well. Yeah. Uh, any other semiconductor companies that are on NVIDIA's level when it comes to chips for AI? Um, not for AI specifically, depending on like, you know, what you mean. So AI means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but basically what NVIDIA does really well is they make GPUs, graphics processing units, and GPUs tend to be the way that modern AI software gets accelerated. So at a high level, the components that they make for PCs and video games, scaled up versions of those are actually the infrastructure you want for the types of servers and supercomputers that run large AI applications, whether you mean open AI's models or whether you mean Google Cloud or whether you just mean big gaming data centers, whatever. Um, accelerators tend to be the way to do that. And that's like the one hardware ecosystem that NVIDIA has a crazy lead on that, you know, I think they have over an 80% market share of both PC GPUs, but also data center GPUs. So they're really the king when it comes to AI acceleration. Because there's certainly, you know, Google, Google owns search right now. I think they have 90% market share, if not yep. higher, obviously open AI and chat GPT are a potential threat to that, you know, as they integrate into Microsoft products and Bing. Yep. Uh, and I've heard though, that chat GPT, you know, like they're, search or query, whatever it's called, you know, requires like 10 times the power of regular Google search. So it's so much more expensive. So it's going to be hard for, you know, Bing and OpenAI to actually make money with Jet, Chat GPT. I don't know if that's actually accurate, but um, what makes it so much more expensive? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just a fundamentally different approach to like answering questions. I think search versus sort of these large language models is kind of uh, not a faulty comparison, but sort of incomplete. There are certain questions you would ask to both of those things, but there are certain things you would never ask search to do that only chat can handle. And there are certain things that you would never ask chat because like a search is really all you need, right? So there's a Venn diagram between the two. And I think people think the overlap between them is a lot bigger than it really is. Um, but these models are big. And they're expensive to run. They use a process called inference, which is fundamentally different than how regular search works. And that's 
pretty relatively new compared to regular indexing and all the things that uh, Google already has done for years to like organize the world's information. And so as a result, there's just like more practice and iteration that needs to go into that to drive the cost down to the same level that a more mature technology like search has already been like driven down and optimized. Um, Google is also coming out with its own large language set of models. Uh, one is called Gemini. They just talked about it at Google IO and Gemini is going to be the GPT-4 competitor. And actually the results look really promising. So Bard came out to an I was just embarrassing say, start. Right yeah, Bard, go ahead. Sorry. Bard was a mess when they announced it like a month ago, right? It was. And, and you know, that's like the whole move fast and break things model in, in Silicon Valley, which maybe I don't agree with. Because if they held their horses for a little bit and got to where they are today before they started talking about Bard and Gemini and all of the things that they're talking about now, I think they'd be on a lot better footing. And a lot of people would take a lot of people would take Google's position in this space a lot more seriously if they were like quiet, 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 and then came out with something very big. Because then the next time they're quiet, you're like, ah, oh, crap, I think they're working on something very big. And instead, they kind of chose to go messy, lose $100 million, $100 billion $100, in market yeah. cap, right? Like, you know, this whole initial Bard fiasco. But Bard is actually shaping up to be a very viable product. Where does, a I mean, like, where does AI go from here over the next few years? Because it feels like there's, there's ways to play it through Google, through Microsoft, uh, NVIDIA. Like, what are the smaller companies that that are doing stuff in AI? Like public companies. I know there's a shitload of startups that are doing yeah. AI stuff, and I don't know any of them, so can't really talk about them. But like, what are the what are the other, you know outside of the mega caps? What other companies could give an investor you know some exposure to AI? Yeah, so I think about AI in a lot of different categories. That's like my channel is kind of pivoted to just being AI because it's turned out to be such a broad space. So the, the first area is just productivity, right? You're looking for the companies that are helping other companies increase their margins by leveraging ChatGPT, MidJourney, and all of these tools to do things that used to have to be done by hand. So whether you're talking about like a design company that went from designing logos for everyone, I'm, I'm making that up as a hypothetical. Right, like, like, um, like, a, like a Canva, I know they're not public, or an Adobe. Ex- you're hundred percent. Like Adobe is a great example, right? With Firefly, you're going to see a lot of productivity move to online uh, excuse me, AI generated, right? So Adobe used to have this model, stock photography, right? Where they would pay photographers every time that their asset got downloaded, right? And so there was this revenue share model, this marketplace for stock photography. Guess what? If you go to stock.adobe.com today and you request an image and they don't have a good one for you, they generate it for you and they eat all of that margin themselves. They keep it because they didn't pay a photographer for that image. They just generated it, you know? So there's there's a lot going on there with tools for creatives. So another example would be Unity Software. That's a publicly traded company. And you know what they do is they're a big toolkit for video games, professional visualization, 3D art and asset design. So they're in spaces like automotive, architecture, and so on. Imagine being able to generate these 3D assets on the fly with AI instead of relying on expensive engineers, you know, graphics designers and people who take weeks and weeks to generate these assets. Now you can kind of make them in days, if not hours, almost to the same fidelity, or at least get them 80% done. And and you don't, you you don't have to pay AI any SBC. (laughs) That's correct. Also, it works 24 seven. It never takes sick days. It, you know, it's reliable. So there's like all these things that AI brings to the table. And so what I think will really happen is one, one layer will be, you know, you're removing a lot of like human lower middle management or like PMs, you're replacing those people with AI, and then you're bringing people one level higher to manage teams of AI and creative individuals that leverage AI. Because it does seem like, you know, as you listen to these Q1 earnings calls, I mean, dozens, if not hundreds (laughs) of companies are now mentioning AI, you know, in their prepared remarks, in their question, you know, question and answer, or even in their releases, Everything from like Zoom info to Duolingo, you know, Duolingo and yep. you know, Khan Academy. Company. Yep. yep. Uh, and then you have a few companies like Chegg that are blaming AI or blaming Chat GPT. Yeah, that was brutal. Yeah. Brutal. I mean, the stock was down 50, 60%, I think, yeah. because, you know, they basically, and I didn't listen to it. I don't have a position in it, but I think they said something along the lines of, you know, kids don't need to come to Chegg for answers anymore. They just go to Chat GPT or yep. something like that. Yeah. Uh, so there are, I mean, there are Fiverr, companies, you know, oh, Fiverr. Yep. Um, so there will be some companies that get crushed by this as well. Right. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So it turns out there's just a lot more mechanical work involved in every day-to-day -day life than we thought. So, you know, I write all of my YouTube videos, you know, I do the research, I put it all together, then I narrate it and put some B-roll over it. That's kind of like my shtick on YouTube. And a lot of that writing is just, okay, I have the outline. I know what I'm going to say. Now I have to bang on and type every word, right? Like, well, that part doesn't need to be me. That can be chat GPT. Here's my talking points. Give me a rough draft. And I, so I've moved from being my own writer to sort of being my own copy editor where chat GPT does like the legwork would take me five, six hours. I'm a slow typer to something like 20 minutes. And then I start with like, instead of a blank page, a first draft, right? So chat GPT is not making my videos, but it's certainly reducing the time it takes me to make them. You know what I mean? Now is multiply there... that by every industry ever. And you can see how margins should expand as, you know, cost of goods and cost of services collapse, right? You just wonder how many jobs will be replaced by AI and chat GPT. Totally. Um, you know, and then also like not just AI, but then the combination ro with robotics, uh, you know, you think about the people that work in McDonald's, like that's always the, you know, the example, you know, how many actual humans will be working in McDonald's five years from now, or is it going to be all just AI and, and robotics? Yeah. And you know what, like throughout history, this has happened over and over, you know, back when the horse and buggy was getting displaced by the automobile, right? A lot of people were saying, Hey, this is crazy. It's destroying a lot of jobs. But what turned out was that the automobile created a whole industry, right? Automotive, then you have automotive repair, maintenance, you have chauffeurs. So like a lot of things transferred over. And then the automotive industry is much bigger than the horse and buggy industry ever was, right? So I do believe that, yes, it's going to dis disrupt some lower level jobs. For example, the person who writes like the initial blog post based on some talking points, you know, it's going to automate others. Robotics is another great example, but it will create a whole new layer of higher paying, more creative, more human jobs that are harder to replace and will require another more advanced technology to replace those people, right? Printing press to the internet, horse and buggy to the automobile, you know, cell phones and like the mobile internet replacing web 1.0 and now generative AI replacing some of the, you know, more manual tasks that come with knowledge work. So you, you talked about automotive. Uh, let's jump into Tesla. Uh, sure. I, assume, I assume you're a shareholder. I, I am a shareholder and like, I don't know what kind of warnings we need, but several oh. of the companies we're talking about, I am a shareholder in. So I never really give warnings. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> not financial advice. I am a shareholder in plenty of the companies. Actually, I think maybe, I think maybe I do on like, once the newsletter actually goes out, I think there's disclosures at the bottom. Um, cool. What, uh, so I, I guess the biggest news with Tesla is yesterday that uh, Elon Musk announced he's hired a new CEO, which everyone assumes is the, have you, did you hear this yet? No, I haven't. This is oh, breaking really? for me. Yeah. Tell oh, me all about okay. it. Okay. I'm breaking it. Yeah. So Elon announced last night, he's got a new CEO. It's a woman, uh, lots of speculation around it. And then today the news was basically oh. confirmed the, I don't know her position, uh, but she was with NBC Universal. And Elon actually, she actually interviewed Elon on stage a couple of weeks ago at some event. So I don't know if that if that's when they met or that's like that, you know, they'd already known each other and they'd already been talking about it. But apparently she's going to be the new CEO of Twitter. Of Twitter, not Tesla. Oh, shit. Yeah, my, my bad. Yeah, of Twitter. <laughs> Holy moly, dude. I you, you, your audience can't see this, but I actually peed a little bit when you said that because I, uh, that was actually really scary. So, okay, I mean, Twitter, in, okay. In some ways, I actually do think uh, Tesla needs a real full-time CEO, and then Elon could be chairperson and whatever else, you know, because he's got so much else going on. Should he really be the CEO of anything, or should he have a CEO in place everywhere, and then he's, you know, he oversees everything? But that's... We can have that discussion later. So yes, I'm talking Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so Twitter is going to have a new CEO who's the former executive from NBC Universal. Sure. Uh, yep. Go ahead. But I mean that that that's probably good for Tesla shareholders, right? It'll help Elon focus more on Tesla. Um, but what are your thoughts on Tesla? They're doing a lot. They have new products coming out. Obviously, the Cybertruck is is going to be pretty interesting. They're building Gigafactories. I think the new announcement was. Are they doing India or Mexico or both? I don't know. I can't even. Yeah, I, I have that. been keeping up with like the new Gigafactory locations, but let's back up for a second to the Twitter thing, right? So I do think it's good that Elon is not going to be the CEO of Twitter anymore. 
it seems his passion and his extreme forte is definitely in these large capital intensive physical product businesses, whether you're talking about Tesla or whether you're talking about SpaceX, right? This guy builds complicated shit very well and can scale it, period. And I just don't think he had a fundamental match of his skill set with a company like Twitter. Somebody who used to work at NBC sounds perfect for Twitter because it's right. it's very analogous to what people do in like normal right. media, right? At, you know, advertising, and exactly, text based, and video, right? right? Like Elon's not in that game. Elon is solving problems that most people really believe that other human beings can't solve, right? Like bringing the world closer to sustainable energy or landing us on Mars in a reasonable time frame, right? So. I think that's where he belongs. Not that I'm anyone to tell no, him what to do, but no. like Tesla and SpaceX is where I want to see him be the CEO, the chair, the, you know, the real driver of innovation there. Right. So on the Tesla front, um, I, I'm a big believer in Tesla. I'm probably a big believer for a reason that not many people talk about. So the one reason that my channel got big pretty quick is because I like talking about what happens after full self-driving becomes a real thing. So I, I believe, and I think other people are starting to come to this conclusion that the car is the next platform. And what I mean by that is you're trapped in a car today and you're driving, right? So that's that's time that's locked away from you. You you can't like watch TV and drive just as an example. But if the car drive itself, now when you buy a Tesla, you're actually unlocking free time if you have a commute and you can use that to watch more TV or be more productive or you know engage with friends or whatever. And so that's one of those sneaky differentiators. Like when you buy a Ford, you have to drive it. When you buy a Tesla, it drives you. All of a sudden, that time cost, like I don't know how people are accounting for that, but you know, when Tesla shows you, hey, that's a nearby shop that we're going to pass, you get a 25% discount if you add it to your journey in real time. I think that's going to mess with a lot of markets. I think there's a huge opportunity post self driving. That like only Tesla will have for a long time. So that's part one of self-driving. And then part two is I think like 95% of the time, maybe even higher, your car sits idle yep. in a garage or a driveway or a parking lot. And why shouldn't your car be out making you money while you're sleeping or working or whatever? So yep. that's kind of part two of the self-driving, right? Totally. And so right now there's a company called Turo, which I personally don't really care for. I've tried them a couple of times and not not to great success. They're but like, They're like the Airbnb of cars. That's exactly right. So there's a lot of opportunity. Why I'm bringing them up is there's a lot of opportunity to disrupt the Airbnb of cars market. But also, you know how there's people who have one Airbnb or their Airbnb their own home. There's also people who are like serial Airbnb business owners, right? They oh, yeah. bought, they have 10 Airbnbs. So I think there will be an opportunity for like amateur fleet managers, right? Where it's like, I'm going to buy 10 Teslas because to me, they're vehicles for cash flow. I can rent them out all day long. Exactly. And now, so there's a market for, you know, low number of owner enterprise fleet management software. That's a whole nother piece of high margin software that Tesla will be able to sell, right? Oh, buy our software, but it bundles with full self-driving, buy our solar energy kit to fuel your cars, you know, fuel in quotes, right? And all of a sudden you get this integrated Tesla package. That's the whole fleet, the energy source, the software to manage it and the software to have them drive themselves. And they've created a high margin bundle in what's traditionally a low margin automotive market, right? So like I'm a big Uber shareholder. It's one of my largest positions. And awesome. I started buying it in the low 20s. Actually, I think I started buying it in like the high 20s, averaged down into the low 20s. And now it's up about 100% from uh, the lows last summer. But and I mean, there's the bear case for Uber is we run into a bad recession. People stop traveling. You know, those airport rides are very profitable. The longer term bear case is, is Tesla and Tesla building their own autonomous, self-driving, you know, yeah. ride sharing network. And, you know, I don't know if I'll own Uber three years from now. Like, I think it's a good story now. So that's why I own it. But I mean, to me, that is a risk of what Tesla does to compete with Uber. And then you have other companies like Cruise that are doing, yep. you know, building something. So like, how is it all going to play out? Is Tesla going to partner with some of these companies or compete against them? Like Uber already has like a hundred million customers. Um, not everybody wants to be in a car, like a self-driving car. Like that's going to take, I think some people are going to have to like, they're not just going to jump on it right away. Totally. You know, 
they, they'll prefer a human for a while and then they'll slowly gravitate over to it. So like, I just wonder how it's going to play out. It's going to be pretty interesting. I, I agree with that. And then another angle, like I, I agree and I don't know, right? I don't have a really informed opinion other than I think Tesla, when they decide they're going to go into ride sharing, they will eat some of uh, Uber's lunch just because all the early adopters will move over. Right. But there's also this question of regulation, right? It's not clear to me that even if they do fully solve full self-driving, let's say today they come out with a car that can no kidding drive itself. It's still up to regulators to let that happen, right? Like in the event of an auto accident, when a car decides you know, to take a certain path and it results in a casualty, and we have the first computer that decides to take a human life in effect, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny and regulation around releasing full self-driving. Who's liable in that case? Tesla, who programmed the computer, the person who is in the passenger seat of this car, like with no steering wheel, or like, how are we going to handle those situations is another big like oh, question yeah. mark to me about yeah. the, the adoption of this kind of technology at scale, right? And I, and I do think it's possible that you could order an Uber and like in the app, you decide, do I want a human to drive me or do I want self-driving? You know, and that's Great where it's a chance for Uber to partner with some of these companies like Tesla or Cruise. Or you might have something where it's like Uber self-driving, but only for eats, right? We'll deliver your groceries with this, but we won't put people in it for a while, right? right? So it's like, we're not willing to handle that. You know, so there, there is tricks like where Uber can play these, these games to like maximize their likelihood of long-term success and minimize their downside while adopting AI. So I'm not, I'm certainly not writing Uber off but their biggest market is going to have a contender when cars can drive themselves for sure. What are some sneaky, so like kind of back to my point from earlier, question from earlier, what are some sneaky AI companies that no one really talks about? So there are a few, like it, de it depends on which side, you know, you want to talk about. Cause again, AI means a lot of things to different people. Um, there's a company called Brainchip, which nobody is talking about right now. It's on the they, OTC they markets. It's oh, okay. Huh? Yeah, it's oh, okay. it's B R C H F. I think is the ticker. They're like thirty cents a share. I'm not. This isn't an endorsement. I'm just talking about a company that exists. Um, but what they do is they have an AI chip that mimics the human brain. So it's like, let me just give you a hypothetical example of why this could be useful. Today, when you train an AI like a neural net to recognize a cat versus a dog, you give it hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of thousands, of images. And then you say, okay, here's the next image. Is this a cat? Yes or no, right? Brain chip, you know, but when you and I, we see a, a gopher for the first time, somebody's like, this is a gopher. And you're like, all right, that's a gopher. And then I show you three images. One of them is a gopher. You'll be able to pick it out, right? You only saw the gopher once, but you're like, I know what a gopher is now. You just told me. Right. That's one of the reasons to, to consider chips that behave like the human brain, because they do what's called one shot or no shot learning. You show it one example and it gets it. Where is that useful? Here's one sample of the COVID-19 virus. Detect it, right? Like here's what a drug sniffing dog smells when they sniff drugs. Detect it, right? So these, what you're doing is for problems where there's low samples of real things, like, you know, 99.9 .9 bat out of a hundred bags that get sniffed for drugs don't contain them, right? 99% of COVID tests come up not COVID. So your rate of true positives are very low. So you just don't have a lot of data to feed these giant algorithms that need a lot of input data. So Brainchip is a company that's a cool investment because all of a sudden for those cases, there's a solution that doesn't really exist in, in these the other AI spaces. So that's one. Um, another one is going to be like big AI beneficiaries. So companies like Epic Games, which makes Unreal Engine or Unity Software, which makes Unity. Um, they're, you know, they're going to be huge beneficiaries of content, whether you're talking about text-based content, image, video, music, whatever, uh, being, being made generatively. Right. So now I don't need to build like the dialogue and story arcs of all these characters. I can have every side character be made by AI and I'm just focusing on the main storyline, all these quests that happen on the side. I don't need to dedicate a human to like fleshing those out you know, or any low probability event where it's like the player may not even touch this part. We'll just let the AI generate the first cut at least. You know what I mean? It's funny you so. mentioned Unity because I don't know a lot about a Unity. I've never owned it before. When it came public, the valuation just seemed crazy to me. So I stayed yeah. away. But I'm now like, I'm getting interested just given, given that it's pulled back. So it actually is going to be one of my next deep dive write-ups. I just have to take the time to, you know, dig in. Um, ironically, my next deep dive write up, and I don't know if I should be saying this, but um, on my large cap 
newsletter is going to be Palantir. Okay. I've I've traded it. Uh, I did own it a couple of years ago after the IPO. I wrote it from like 10 to $20 and then sold it and never looked back. And it went to 40 and then came all the way back down. And of yep. course, that's when ARC sold it, right? ARC wrote it all the way up, wrote it all the way down, <laughs> sold yep. it at like 10 or 11. It went down to, I think, Seven, maybe? seven, yeah, like maybe high sixes, even, yeah, yeah. like, and then and now it's at like nine or ten, right? Yeah, now. so it's had it's re- it's reported a couple good quarters in a row. Yeah, they're they're more focused on profits now than ever before. Uh, it, it seems like SBC is coming down as a percentage yep. of revenues, and now Arc is back in there buying again. So I just kind of find that funny. But is Palantir a company that you follow? It's a company I follow very closely. Um, right. I I gotta I do have to like insert a caveat here, so. Palantir allowed me to use Foundry. And what okay. that means is they monetarily compensated me, right? Because Foundry is not free. I am a shareholder. I no longer have Foundry. So I'm able to talk about them publicly again. I have no other insider information at all, except being able to have used Foundry in the past. So I do have to say that before I talk about the company or the stock ever, which is why I rarely make content about it anymore. But you can go through my videos on both Unity and Palantir if you're interested and at least understand them at a high level from like a technology side. Um, I think Palantir is an incredible company. I think they're caught in a bad situation, which is um, a lot of the tools and software and features that they have now are either going to get displaced or disrupted by some of these generative AI tools. Okay. So like we can get into it, we can skip it. I don't know how much you want to talk about Palantir, but I do have like a, a lot of like nuanced things to say about them. Is the other problem that they're kind of like a secretive company so no one really knows, like, kind of like black box stuff. <laughs> no, I, so they're actually incredibly transparent with like right. what their products do and don't do. They don't store any data themselves, and that's where I think there's like a lot of entanglement. Is like they provide a lot of really powerful data processing tools, but they don't like have access to your data. They just okay. like help you stand it up. And because like some features are advanced enough, and some of their pl- platforms are advanced enough, they do some consulting work to like help businesses understand their data, which means, you know, now they're looking at your business data and stuff to like help you get stood up. Right. But they're very ethical. Like I've worked with people at Palantir as part of having access to Foundry. They were awesome. They never, you know, there was nothing that gave me a bad sense of anything. And I worked with a lot of different people there during my time with Palantir. And they started off mostly doing government work, right? And then Correct. started to add more commercial or enterprise business. Yeah. And, and it's good to differentiate those two businesses because they take place in two entirely different platforms. Palantir's Gotham platform is primarily for government and DOD. And Palantir's Foundry platform is their commercial first platform. Which one is growing faster right now? My my understanding is it's Foundry now, and you know Gotham is still growing. That's their government side, but they're pivoting to focus more on commercial. And they're doubling down on things like Foundry. They've also brought more features from Apollo, which is their like infrastructure platform, onto the commercial side. And I believe they re- just announced a new platform recently called AIP, which is like more focused on generative AI and chat interfaces and things like that into their other products. You know, like a- using a chat bot to query things about your own proprietary data, for example. Um, so yeah, they're a really good, interesting, pure play ish, um, advanced AI company for sure. If you could only own, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, if you could only own three or four companies for the next three or four years, uh, which ones would be at the top of your list? Three or four years. Oh, okay. Um, do I have to buy them at today's prices or can they be companies I already own or like, oh yeah, they'd be companies you already own. Oh, for sure. So I definitely think NVIDIA in five years will still be the king of AI. I think it's going to be incredibly hard to displace them unless like AI changes completely. I think that's one. I I really do like the content creator space. I'm not so sure Unity is going to be like a top performer, but there's really no other company like it. Unity and Epic Games are very, very different. Um, so I would probably- Epic's hold- private, right? Epic's private, but also Unreal Engine just does incredible things that Unity can't do. And at the same time, Unity software does a lot of things that Unreal can't do. So like they're they are pretty complementary, I think, even though they're like competing markets. Like if you're in mobile or you're in AR and VR, you're using Unity. Okay. And if you're doing like high-end desktop stuff, you're probably using Unreal, right? Okay. So, so there's a difference there. 
I don't know. I think my other picks are going to be like pretty boring. It's going to be like Taiwan Semiconductor and maybe well, was, like a I really was, good. I was going to ask if you could if you could own any semi, but I mean, you did pick Nvidia first. Yeah, and like so, I would want to own that whole stack, right? And then I think the other company is going to be equally boring. It's going to be something like a Microsoft, right? Like Microsoft because they've seemed to avoid like all this regulatory scrutiny. I don't know how they manage it as a mega cap. But the government never seems to go after Microsoft in the same way they go after Google and Facebook and like all these companies. And Microsoft is like coming out with more and more product suites. They're putting generative AI in all of their products and services with Copilot. They own pretty incredibly rich data sources. So they own GitHub and they own LinkedIn, which like I guarantee you in the next year, maybe two, we're going to start seeing companies privatize their data, right? Reddit. LinkedIn, all these companies are going to say, hey, if you want to crawl our database to train your AI models, you're going to pay us for that. Yeah. Right. So like Pinterest, I think is a really interesting company because they have the best data in the world on like, this is where a company where people go to do their pre-purchase research. So everyone who's using Pinterest has a high intent to purchase. They're looking for something very specific and they get connected to vendors that they're like already ready to pull the trigger. Right. So imagine if a company like Amazon could step in and buy a Pinterest, like what that would do for their like e-commerce platform or a company like Shopify, right? So maybe the last company would be something where it's like, I'm not so sure that this is a good company on its own, but I bet it's going to be acquired for a huge premium, kind of like how Twitter was specifically because they have data that like no one else can get. You know? Oh yeah, no, I definitely think we're going to see some interesting acquisitions over the next couple of years, but the one, the one hurdle is going to be the you know, was it the FCC? You know, the third oh, yeah, of course, FTC, yes. right? I mean, what yeah. what acquisitions do they allow to go through? I mean, obviously, they're already having a problem with Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard, Activision, yep. right? Not if it was the U.S. or I, I think UK is having it's a UK, big yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, right, right, that's like that might be the first deal that Microsoft's tried to do in a while that might not go through. Yeah, uh, although I think Activision gets like a three billion dollar breakup fee, so. Uh, they're not they're not hurting too bad if it doesn't go through. <laughs> yeah, I think and I think that's fair because like the scrutiny is Microsoft is one of the big kings of video games today. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, right. The whole Xbox ecosystem. And then they own some other incredible franchises. Right. So it's like adding companies like or sorry, adding franchises like World of Warcraft and Overwatch to that. Right. And, you know, Call of Duty and things like that. Yeah, I can see how that starts looking a little monopolistic. I'm not convinced that it's a monopoly, but, you know. I can see how the scrutiny is coming in. Uh, where's the best place for everyone to find you online? And I'll, we'll put these links like in the show notes, of course. But Sure, yeah. So I run a YouTube channel right now. It's called Ticker Symbol U. So it's spelled Y-O-U. Um, if you type in Ticker, you will probably see this beautiful ginger face come up. Uh, and that's the best place to find me. I'm exclusively on YouTube right now. Um, you know, I don't really have like a huge website or like I'm not really on other platforms. I've like quadrupled down on YouTube. You're on Twitter, Twitter too, right? I'm on Twitter. Yep. But I'm on Twitter sort of as like a more passive, like I engage with people there directly. I don't really share nuanced deep dives or anything on Twitter. It's all the type of stuff that I do like usually tends to need that visual component. There's a lot of like explainers in my videos. So I tend to use video to do all my investment. Like, hey, here's my thesis on this company. Okay, awesome. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining today. Really sure. appreciate it. Glad to get your insights and look forward to doing it again sometime. I hope so. Yeah, this has been a blast. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. Talk to you soon.